Amen. It's a beautiful song with a lot of truth to it, isn't it? Amen. Ever since we met Jesus, he really has given us the victory. Yes, and we can live a life of victory because of that. Amen. And uh, if you'll turn in your Bible tonight to 1 John chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse number 7. And I just want to thank you, Pastor, for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak tonight. You know, I don't have any uh, grand theological statement to make. I just have a few simple truths out of God's Word. And, you know, uh, honestly, that, that alone just kind of speaks to me, that God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. God is really, His truth, His love is simple. Yeah. But it reaches to the furthest depths of reality. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it's just a wonderful thing to know that God loves you and I. That we can live a life that God has supplied to you and us because of his love. Amen. And so I just want to begin reading in 1 John chapter 4. You know, as uh, Pastor Dan Gray, my grandfather, used to say, it's pretty easy to uh, find out where 1 John is because it comes right before 2 John. So beginning in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it begins by saying, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent, uh, sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so I just want us to focus on uh, one fact tonight, the fact that God is love, according to verse 8. So let's pray real quick as we enter into God's word. Lord, we thank you very much for this time that you've given us just to learn from your word and learn from your will. Lord, I pray that you just make that evident to us tonight in this very moment. God, I pray that you would just uh, give me the words to speak, that I would speak with clarity, that I would speak with simplicity, Lord, that I wouldn't say anything amiss. And God, I pray that our hearts and ears uh, would just be completely open to your will for our lives. And so that as we walk out of here tonight, we'll be able to walk out of here drawing closer to thee. And I pray all this in your heavenly and holy name. Amen. Amen. So I want us to focus on verse 8, like I said. Uh, let's just reread it real quick. It says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Yeah. Yeah. And even further in verse 7, the very first phrase says, Beloved, let us love one another. And so we realize here that love is defined with one word, one word only, God. God is love. That's a beautiful phrase, if you ask me. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And uh, reading verse 7 and verse 8, we understand that we are given a mandate to love. Now, if in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's what all the law is, love. And all the law is God. So the fact of the matter is, just, just by reading these two passages of Scripture, to live a life of love is to live a life for God. Yeah. There is no other way you can live a life with true eternal love than when you live it for the Lord. And if you'll turn with me tonight to Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, I'd like to just give you a little bit out of that as well, a little bit of, of truth about what God says about love. So Matthew 22, verse 34 where it begins to say, But when the Pharisees had heard that he, Jesus, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Or what's the greatest commandment ever in the law? And Jesus saith unto him, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. See, all the law, as I've said, is all about love. It's all about God. So living with love means living with God. And there is no such thing as a true eternal love than that which is lived for Christ. And so I also want us to focus on just a couple aspects. We've learned, we've, we see here that living with love means living with God. But without God, then a life of love cannot exist. A life without love, without God, is powerless. If you'll turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I know I'm being kind of speedily here. But I'm taking you all through a lot of passages in the Bible. But oh my goodness, there's so much truth to learn from all this. So if you'll read with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I'll just read the first three verses. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. 
So you got, we, we understand here that when we live a life of love, our lives are given meaning. Christ is the reason we have purpose in our lives. If I, if I choose to live a life without God, if I choose to live a life where I reject his salvation, where I reject his will for my life, if I choose to live a life for myself, it amounts to nothing. I could cure cancer. I could end world hunger. I could do all these great and wonderful things. But the fact of the matter is, if I'm not focused on the love of God and the love of God for other people, then there is no way on earth that any of that will amount to anything. Why? Because, well, those are fleshly things. The fact of the matter is, if I'm not loving through the eyes of God, with the heart of God, I will never love their eternal soul. Yeah. Right. I will never love the eternal souls of those that need his salvation, that right. we needed his salvation, I needed his salvation. If someone didn't have that love uh, of God showing through them to me, I wouldn't be able to be here today showing you all the, as, as much as the love of God as I can muster today. <laughs> and I know that I, I'm not worth much, but the fact of the matter is with God, I can, I can do literally all of his will for my own life. You can do all of God's will for your life. The fact of the matter is Theo preached a great message and gave a great testimony about how God has directed his life. Why? God directed his entire life because of God's love. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, God's will is only going to be lived. God's will is only going to be really accomplished when we live with the love of God. Yeah. And so living without that love means we're nothing. It means we can't accomplish anything that's worth anything. And the fact of the matter is living with love gives us purpose. But not only that, but God's love, it, in, it completely encompasses every person in this world. If you'll turn with me now to Matthew chapter 27, uh, I'll be reading in verse number 15 there. I'll get there eventually. Matthew chapter 27. Now in this portion of scripture, Jesus Christ is standing before Pilate and before the Jews. The Jews are crying out for him to be crucified. But Pilate has an idea. So beginning in verse number 15 of chapter 27, begins by saying, Now at the feast, the governor was wont uh, to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had, uh, they and they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For, if he, knew that for, uh, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and uh, elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the, of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could have prevailed nothing, he, but that rather a, a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of this blood, of uh, the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now we know that Christ died for all people. There is no person that lives outside the love of God. The but the fact of the matter is, this is one of the most convicting passages in the Bible to me. Because when I was younger, I used to look at Barabbas and say, oh, what a terrible person. You know, the people chose to release Barabbas instead of release Christ. Why would they do such a thing? Barabbas is a sinner. Well, just come with me in my spiritual imagination. I don't mean to add or take away from the Bible, but in my spiritual imagination, I think how Barabbas may have been sitting within his prison cell contemplating on his own life. The Bible calls him a notable prisoner, a notable criminal. There was no question that he was guilty. His sin was known. People knew what he was guilty for. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, he may have been sitting in that prison cell just thinking to himself, when all of a sudden beyond the four walls of his cell, he begins to hear a crowd outside shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And he begins to wonder, I wonder who's being crucified. I wonder who the crowd could be so angry at. And then perhaps not just um, longer after that, he begins to hear his name being shouted. We want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And he begins to put two and two together thinking, oh no, <laughs> my time is up. Perhaps he thought that his sins had finally come to be paid for. It was time for him to pay for his own sins, that his judgment was finally upon him. 
Perhaps some Roman soldiers came to receive him and take him out of his cell and lead him out to the crowd with, uh, where judgment was being placed. And as he walked out to the people that were calling for, for crucifixion, that were calling for judgment, he gets out there and sees a man standing in the way. He sees Christ standing in the way. <laughs> I'm telling you, folks, that convicts me so much. Thinking about the fact that I, was, I would look down on Barabbas in my younger years so much, but the fact of the matter is Christ stood in the way for Barabbas. Yeah. Christ took Barabbas' place, yeah. took Barabbas' punishment. The, the death on the cross that Barabbas should have had that day went to Christ. And you know what? That is exactly like you and I. You and I are nothing more than a Barabbas. Yeah. Because we were imprisoned in our own sin. And our judgment was called for. The sin that we had committed called for a sacrifice, called for a payment. And in, in the midst of that judgment, in the midst of really our, our own sin, Jesus Christ stood in the way for you and I. Why did he do that? Why did Christ stand in the way for you and I? Well, that's because of his love. He loved you and I so much. He went to the cross. Here we are. We were singing songs just earlier. I love to tell the story yes. of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. Yeah. Look, there is no life worth living than that which is lived for Christ. I keep saying that. I know I keep repeating it, but the fact of the matter is a life filled with God's love is a life worth living. Amen. And so I want us to understand that, ponder on it, contemplate on it, <laughs> because I keep having to. I keep coming back to it. It's amazing. Christ stood in the way for you and for me because of his, his love. But even further than that, we find that not only does, li uh, does living a life of love mean living a life with God, not only do we find that we are powerless without love, but, lift, but with love we have God's power on our own lives. Not only do we find that God's love empowers or encompasses every person, that no one is outside of God's love, yeah. but we find that the fruits of the Spirit all begin with love even. Yeah. If you'll turn with me now to Galatians chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 22. Oh, I'm telling you, this just, this fires me up. Amen. This absolutely fires me up. <laughs> oh, my just thinking about the love that God has for you and I. In Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first word in that list? Love, love joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Folks, isn't that encouraging? Yeah. The fact of the matter is, the fruit of the Spirit begins with love. Whose love? God's love. God's love for you and I. God's love for, really, all people in this world. If we, you know, we are called in the same chapter. We, we are called into liberty in Galatians chapter 5. The Bible explains that. Because of the salvation that Christ has extended to us, when we have personally ex accepted by faith God's salvation for us, we are called unto liberty. We are free from sin. Yeah. But as we are free from sin, we're now not called to walk in the flesh. We are called to walk in the spirit. And as we walk in the Spirit, the very first thing, the very first fruit that we ought to produce is love. Yeah. That is the first thing that must, must come. And everything else, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, everything else will follow when we first love with a Christ-like love. Amen. And so I, that, that just convicts me so much. And the love of God is an example that even stirs us to action. You know, John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God gave us the greatest example of love that we could ever have. Now, I'm not saying that we have to go die on a cross ourselves, but shouldn't be willing to lay down our own pride, mm -hmm. lay down our own selves, our own desires. Why? For the needs of others, yeah. for the call of God in our lives. Yeah. You see, several years ago, uh, scientists had found or you could say discovered or put a term to this new emotion, uh, something that they had never really thought about before. And they labeled it Kama Matu. I may, may be mispronouncing it. But essentially what this emotion is, is when one witnesses an act of kindness or an act of love being really put on display in front of them, and there's a sense of urgency or a desire to go and do the same thing, to go and share that same love. 
That's Kamama 2. And the interesting thing is Kamama 2 literally translates to one of two things, either love story or book of love. But folks, you and I have in our hands the greatest love story ever told. The greatest book of love really resides in our hearts, sits at our fingertips. We have the greatest display of love in our lives. And you know what? We're not only able to read about it, we've witnessed it. When again, we've, when we've accepted Christ by faith into our lives, we have witnessed the greatest act of love anyone can ever witness. So the fact of the matter is, where's our kamama to? Where are we when are we willing to, dis to display that same love for others, just to share that love, share the gospel, and to edify the brethren? So often in my own life, I, I get to a point where I'm so focused on myself. I'm, I'm studying at Crown College. I'm learning to be able to serve in a church, to be able to preach, to be able to do all these things. But the fact of the matter is, I can get so focused on myself that I, have, I will have no desire to share the gospel right. with those around me. That's and that's a danger. Look, I, can, I understand needing to build myself up for the, the sake of the ministry, but the fact of the matter is, if I'm building myself up just for the sake of building myself and not being able to pour myself out to the people I'm with, yeah. then I'm worth nothing. Because again, I'm not sharing that love. Yeah. I'm not living it out in my own life. I'm just hiding it in my heart and not really doing anything with it. And that's a sin. Yeah. Because we've been given the Great Commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because God loves all people. God loves all creatures. And so the fact of the matter is, should we not be working to express that love, that love of God that ought to shed abroad in our hearts? Look, our cups run over. Mm -hmm. When we're focused on the Lord, our cups run over with joy. But yeah. when our cups run over, it ought to run over into the cups of others. Yeah. Should it not? Amen. And so where's your kamama to? Does your heart have to be broken tonight? I know mine does. My heart has to continually be broken if I ever want to express the love of God in my own life to those I'm around. You know, my grandfather from this, behind this pulpit once said that love is not spelled L-O-V-E. It's spelled W-O-R-K. Yeah. Love is work. Yeah. Love has to be worked at. Love has to be grown. But with the love of God, it won't be hard. Yeah. It, it may have its challenges, but I'll tell you, with God, all things are possible, right? Yeah. And so the fact of the matter is, folks, does your heart need to be broken? Do, we, do you know for certain that you're living the love of God in your own life? You may have it in your heart. You may be saved tonight. But are you living like it? Are you living out the, the, the walk of the, of the Spirit? And are you living out love? Are you letting love empower you? Are you letting love encompass you? And are you living a life of love so that you're living a life for God? Just wanted to share that with you all tonight. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to, to speak. But I've been so caught up in the topic of God's love. Amen. Oh, it's been so wonderful. Amen. So let's just focus now on being able to spread that love, spread that gospel. Because the gospel is love, isn't it? Because God is love. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you, my friend. You know, my whole life I have to say I reject love often. You know why? Because it makes me vulnerable. It does. Uh, maybe we would say we reject that love because it makes us vulnerable. We, we reject love because someone may reject us, right? In God's economy, we understand, I'm not referring to personal relationships necessarily here, but what I'm saying in God's economy, uh, when we understand that when we express God's love to others, we, we have the understanding that if there's any rejection, that people aren't rejecting us, they're rejecting the Lord, we were just talking about this a few moments ago, weren't we? Some of the history of trying to get the, the love of Christ, that message to this county. There have been times when uh, well, we used to be able to go down into the Farm Fresh parking lot. Well, we got disinvited to that after a while. And uh, somehow people thought that was harmful. And we could take that personally, get upset about things like that. But we understand that somebody's rejecting God's love. I don't know how that happens, but love does make us a bit vulnerable. But, you know, Christ did express his love for us, made him eternally vulnerable in a sense where he took on our sin, went to the cross. Even before all that, you know, this morning, did you catch it in the Bible lesson this morning in Sunday school where we were talking about being buffeted about? Buffeted about. Job talked about that, being buffeted. It was, he was buffeted about by Satan. And then one of the examples in the lesson was how in part of Christ's punishment and torture, excuse me, his torture before he went to the cross. One of the things they did where they took turns, they covered his head and took turns 
buffeting him, not knowing where that blow was coming from. That's what it's like sometimes. And he, made, he, would keep, he made himself completely vulnerable for our sake. And I know this, the Holy Spirit needs to do a complete work in my heart to make me anywhere willing to have that for other people. But may the love of God be shed abroad in our heart. Amen. And God's directing some of us. I'm glad God directed these two men. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 says, If you desire the office of a bishop, you desire a good thing, gentlemen. So I want you to keep pursuing it. They've been a blessing to us tonight, haven't they? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. And I want you to consider what's been preached. I've extended it just a little bit because I'm a preacher. And when I hear preaching, I want to preach. I'm going to refrain from that tonight. But it's interesting to hear Theo talk about God working in his life and using the pain in his life to give him direction. And may God help us to see that God has a direction for each one of us. Are you following God's will for your life? Not in a general way, but in a specific way. Can you say yes to that? Are you convinced of it? What proof do you have? Are you following God's will for your life? Are you convinced of it? And if so, what proof do you have? That's between you and the Lord, but I I think you ought to be able to answer that question. And uh, let's not try to tell the Lord what his business is. If he's dealing with you, you ought to give God your life, and he will give you back his best. Give God your life. He will always give you back his best. And then I know you need help, like I need help, having the love of God in your heart. May God grant us that love. May we be willing to be made a fool of so that we can express the love of Christ of others to others. Let's stand together while we begin to play here. Have thine own way, Lord. The altar is open. If we will learn to love, people's lives will be changed. We'll say yes to the Lord. People's lives will be changed. And I hope you understand that you you should just keep saying yes to the Lord. That's the wonderful adventure of following God's will for your life, I believe, is realizing that he's always writing new pages and new chapters. And there's there's multiple stations where we stop and surrender. Multiple places where we stop and surrender. And it's exciting. It's what makes God's work exciting and I'm glad I'm doing God's will for my life it took a while for me to get there even after I said yes the, it was a, quite a pathway to get where I'm at today but I'm glad I said yes to the Lord I hope you will we'll sing a verse of this and I'll try to stop preaching these men preaching their message but I, I want this for me I want it for our church you come and let God speak to your heart have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I Father, we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for two fellows that want to serve you and that have been willing to stand and speak to us tonight for your glory. I pray, Lord, we remember the lessons of allowing you to guide our life. And may we always say yes to you, no matter how uh, ill-equipped we think we are. Lord, may we realize that you're the great equipper, that you will prepare us. 
And when the task is too large for us, whatever it may be, Lord, we know that's when your work can get done through us. And Lord, I pray that your love would be shed abroad in our heart. May that be the testimony of our lives, of this church. And um, may we be overwhelmed by your love. May our cup run over. As we heard our brothers say, may it run over in the lives of others who need your love. We pray that you'll do that for us as we go forward this week. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you, gentlemen, for helping us. It's been a blessing, hasn't it? And uh, I want to remind you again, we have these offering plates available tonight. If you still have the, would like to have the opportunity to pay the tithe and give offerings as you leave this evening, uh, as we stand right now, as we leave these meetings tonight, I want you to remind you to, to make sure you check your text messages and emails as we stay in touch as we move forward. Uh, I think many of our smaller groups may be able to meet. We have lots of things on the schedule. We have a ladies' Bible study. Uh, we have on this Saturday, we have a men's prayer breakfast. There's a, a baby shower for Hannah uh, and Caleb and their new new baby girl that's coming into the world very soon. And we're trying to honor all those things. We may have to make some adjustments to them. And I'm not willing to make a decision right now and just try to fix everything. It's a fluid thing, as many people say. And we'll work through all those things. We'll plan to meet together. If there are any changes, I'll make sure that we notify as soon as we can. Let's pray. Uh, truly, we should have spent more time in prayer today. This has been, been called a, a day of prayer by our own president. And uh, so I'd encourage you even tonight before you go to bed and go to sleep, you ought to pray for our country. This is my prayer, that God would keep people safe, keep them healthy, certainly, but that people would recognize their need for the Lord. And so let's be ready to express some confidence, not a, a cockiness, not a sarcasm, and not a cynicalness. Let's be ready to express some confidence about who God is and what he's doing in this world. And the fact that we're not too happy about what's going on either. We're pretty concerned about it. In fact, sometimes I could, fear, I could be fearful, but God is faithful. And if we could communicate that right now, I think we'd do God's work in the places that God allows us to go. You stay safe. Take care of yourself. Keep washing your hands. Do that, please. We, we laugh, but keep doing it. And um, take, care of, you have, take care of your needs. Let's reach out to other people in our church. You know, there are people that are shut in uh, that could use a phone call or a text message. And I want you to do that. And we'll be doing that ourselves over the next few days. But if you need us for anything, you feel free to call or just to call away. And I'll be glad to do anything we can for you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed this evening and ask God to bless all that's taking place. Father, guide us as we go. This is your day. We have attempted to honor the opportunity that we have and the command we have to, to assemble. And Lord, we, we realize at times like this, we ought not take that for granted as the different stipulations are being put in place by our government, and for we believe for good cause, we understand that the opportunity to meet, uh, Lord, may, may be something we don't get to do as much as we have done in the past. And Lord, I pray that our, 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 uh, those in authority over us would exercise good wisdom. They have the weight of the world on their shoulders. They have many people in their ear telling them what's right and what to do. At uh, this time, Lord, I pray that they would all bow their hearts, their knees to you. I pray for President Trump. I pray that you would guide him, give him wisdom from above. I pray for Governor Ralph Northam, that you would guide him, Lord. May he seek your wisdom from above. And I pray that it would be in the hearts of these, men's, these men to protect and to, and to help the people that they have an authority over. And Lord, I pray you'd be with local authorities here, even in Isle of Wight County and the city of Suffolk and places in Newport News, and that you'd give those folks wisdom. Lord, again, help us to remember that you are faithful. You are so faithful to us. I pray that we would rest in your faithfulness and that, Lord, we truly could be a witness to a world that absolutely needs you, not just in a moment of crisis, but for eternity. And we thank you for the opportunity to represent you in these days. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you as you go. Thank you for being here today. Amen.